right? Suddenly we're seeing all of these old ideas that we thought we'd um, beaten back, rushing back to the forefront. Hey, that was my friend, Alex Sluser, my guest this week on What on Earth is Going On. My name is Ben Charland. Welcome to the show. The book that Alex and I discussed today is called The People vs. Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It by Yasha Munk. It's a fascinating book that gets to the bottom of this question of populism. But not just that, but where it comes from. What are the fractures in our society, in our politics, in our institutions that are leading to this populist disruption? And Munk has a very interesting idea. He is essentially saying that the ideas of liberalism and democracy, two things that have gone together very well for almost 100 years, are being rendered asunder, are actually now in opposition, and that this is part of that crisis. For more information about the book, you can go to the website. That's www.wogopodcast.com, W-O-E-G-O podcast.com. And at that website, you can find all previous episodes, all future episodes, more information about the show, and you can get in touch on that website. Please follow the show on social media. Wogo Podcast is the handle on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And send me a note with your feedback, your suggestions for future episodes, wogopodcast at gmail.com. And finally, if you like the show, give it a rating on iTunes or whatever podcast app that you use. Anyways, I'm really excited about this conversation, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Here's Alex Sluser. All right, I'm with Alex Sluser here at the Parliament of Canada in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, and we're going to talk about this book, uh, The People Versus Democracy by Yasha Munk. And I think I'm saying that right. I, I looked so. it up uh, just earlier today. Munk, it's not Monk. Um, and uh, th- th- I found this book fascinating. So you and I, both non-experts, are going are to tackle this book and talk about what this book is trying to say and, uh, and what we got from it. Um, so before we do, I just wanted to tackle a few terms, though, that are in this book. Um, th- one of them, of course, is, uh, well liberal or liberalism, um, which I think is important because a lot of listeners might think of liberal as being progressive, left-wing, left-leaning, whereas the definition of the term in this book is something much more classically British, the original definition of liberalism. I don't know if you want to take a shot at at just defining that for us and maybe also defining the word democracy because those are the two key words in this book. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the, you're right, there is this sort of existing preconception that uh, when we talk about a liberal democracy, democracy, we're talking about a capital L liberal democracy. Mm-hmm. But in a lot of political science examination, um, liberal democracy is taken to mean more like a democratic system that prizes freedoms and the establishment of freedoms in its actual governance structure. Mm-hmm. So in Canada, you see things like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right? That's an actual uh, document, a living text that's mm-hmm. part of our political system. And so because it prizes rights and freedoms, we can you know, safely say that Canada is considered a liberal democracy as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, democracy itself speaks more to this idea that you have governance that is predicated on the people having a say in how the country is run. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about rule by, um, by the general population, those who, members who are citizens who are part of it. And, you know, democracy... Uh, and this is something that that Munch actually gets to in the book quite a uh, quite a bit, is uh, something that we kind of uh, take for granted in a way, or maybe liberal democracy mm-hmm. uh, more so, because what we conventionally think of as democracy is something that is a little more closer to liberal democracy. No, I think you've hit it, Alex, yeah. and I think yeah. that what we're getting at is that I mean, what Munch's primary argument is is that these two things have gone together like bread and butter for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And now they seem to be opposed to one another. And now they seem to be, you know, uh, decombob- discombobulating or deconsolidating is the word that Munk uses Correct. in the book. And uh, the crisis of authoritarian populism is partly the, the result of these things. But another aspect of the book that I'm sure we're going to talk about is, is semantics and what these terms mean, what they mean for people, and the different ways you can talk about it. So liberal democracy could also be called, say, institutional democracy, mm-hmm. democracy through institutions, like the, the right of people to vote, personal freedoms and liberties. These are institutions as much as the Supreme Court of Canada, which we can actually see through our window mm-hmm. as an institution, both as a building and an organization, but also 
as a functioning part of this sort of story of a democracy. Anyway, so, I mean, terms are very important to this book, and I want to talk about those as well as the real practical effects. And some of the horrors that I felt in reading this book, mm -hmm. some of the statistics yep. were truly horrifying, mm -hmm. um, that, that the, what the current climate of populism and backlash is really predicated upon. But before we get to all that, I'm going to go to the, I guess, the second question of this episode, um, which is what on earth is going on? So, Alex, according to this book, what is this book trying to say about what on earth is going on? Well, according to the book, what we're seeing in terms of our existing democratic systems that we are, you know, very familiar with is we're seeing retrenchment of those liberal democratic values. We're starting to see the erosion, the gradual deconsolidation of liberal democracy, and we're starting to see something that is a little more akin to um, the rise of populist politics and a democratic system that is focused on the rule of the people. This is something that in traditional political science we've looked at and seen as the, the fear of the tyranny of the majority. You have everybody running the show and nothing's actually getting done or, or uh, nothing is being accomplished because it's all about pandering to the broad population. Or alternatively, things are getting accomplished, but they are at the expense of the minority. Correct. And this is one of the things that Munch goes into in the book, where he says that um, a lot of these populist tendencies that we're seeing more and more of, if you look to the United States and other countries, which are you know traditionally known to be liberal democracies, they're exhibiting tendencies towards uh, populism, which ultimately if you look at the, the political history behind it all, they start to uh, impose conditions on minority groups. They start actually victimizing the right. population, yeah. the, the citizens themselves. So what you see is a, a call for rule by the people, and then you start to see the people being subjugated by the strong men that they've called right. for. Right. It's almost the classic story of revolution, right? Yeah. So there's um, a despotic or corrupt or tyrannical regime. The people overthrow said regime Everyone seems to be happy, but the people who have overthrown it then become the new tyrants. Um, almost, they can't even help it. They're paranoid. They, uh -huh. they feel like there's another revolution that's going to come right behind them, uh, and they feel that they're right. There's always this kind of, this axis in politics of right versus wrong, and if I'm right and I'm in power, well, why would I not do what I think is right? Uh -huh. and why would I let those who are wrong stop me? especially if they're going to use things that are blatantly undemocratic. Again, the reference of the Supreme Court. A lot of people would say that the Supreme Court in Canada, in the United States, or courts everywhere are undemocratic institutions. They're not elected by the people. Right. They are composed of people who have been appointed, uh, and they act as checks on this majoritarian rule. Mm -hmm. But of course, these institutions also exist to protect the individual. And I think that that's another way to, to frame liberal democracy. You could also call it individualist democracy in a way, because liberalism in that classic sense is an ideology that is meant to enfranchise and empower the individual as the sole sovereign entity within the state, that nothing can override the rights of the individual, except, of course, in circumstances of grave danger, right. where we can, I suppose, you can, and this is arguable too. I mean, this is up for debate. Can you suspend the rights of people um, in the event of, uh, say, um, the, the 1970 FLQ crisis in Absolutely, Quebec. Absolutely, right? yeah. Was the War Measures Act and the invocation of that act by Pierre Trudeau uh, the right thing to do? And a lot of liberals, classic liberals, would say, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. You can never, ever trample on the rights of, of the individual. And as soon as you do, you are taking a step away from liberal democracy. Um, and, you know, and Munch in this book gives a lot of examples. I mean, the, the big one, of course, on everyone's mind is Donald Trump. Of course. A, a populist who is, is rising to power on a, on a very democratic message, even if you would argue, and a lot of people do, that he didn't actually win a majority of the votes. Right. So he's not even a democratically elected president. Um, but he believes that he's doing what the people, what real Americans uh, want him to do, and that no institution, whether it's the Justice Department or the Supreme Court, uh, should be able to stand in his way. Mm -hmm. This is a feature of, of populism, but it's happening in other countries, whether it's Hungary or Poland or the United Kingdom with Brexit, um, in Russia, of course. I mean, there's many, too many examples now, too many frightening examples. But there's this word populism 
what what do you i mean i and i i see you wanted to say something else so say that too but i wanted to ask you according to this book and he gives a bit of a summary of populism what is this word this amorphic word populism well what's interesting about the way he puts it and the way he describes it is it, it populism itself is a kind of um it is a kind of democratic concept in itself like democracy itself is meant to be rule by the people. Mm-hmm. And so populism is something that directly appeals to the people. And um, and in many of these cases, you see a leader or a party emerge that starts saying, you know, we are the voice of the people. We are, we are speaking for you. We will actively represent you. Um, but it's done so in a way that it, it appeals to a kind of base level. It appeals to core I- uh, themes of identity, um, core themes of uh, strength and in many cases the the idea of rebuilding strength and of course we keep seeing this in the United States with Trump's concept of making America great again he's suggesting and has suggested that America has been beaten down by the international system it's been cut out of things it's been the the victim of bad deals and bad negotiations mm-hmm. and it needs to be rebuilt and made better again and it's been betrayed by people who are Americans. Right. Who, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and <laughs> the interesting thing about that is he points to people within the actual country as a source of uh, greater national pain. Mm-hmm. And and so this in, in, in itself is, um, are, you know, very uh, hallmarks, they're, they're hallmark features of populism. Um, what's interesting about what you were saying earlier too is, uh, you know, Munch is fairly clear in demonstrating that while we have our attention focused on Donald Trump and everything going on in the United States, this is something that's been happening for quite some time. Uh, countries like Hungary and Poland and even the United Kingdom have all demonstrated these same types of populist tendencies creeping into their rhetoric and becoming widespread. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, reading this book, I, I actually started going back to some previous books that I'd read on illiberal democracy. And when we say illiberal democracy, we're talking about something that is functionally a democracy, but the actual rights and freedoms are, have started to be chipped away. So right. you'll see populist tendencies, but ostensibly uh, the institutional structures themselves are being subverted. Um, so I went back to a couple of books. One was um, The Future of Freedom f- uh, by Fareed Zakaria, who... Um, you know, he sort of, uh, well, I mean, first off, I'm a big fan of his work, but he looked at the, the rise of a liberal democracy in the early 2000s, but within a very, um, sp- like, specific or particular scope um, of America being a country that has all the po- uh, possibilities or opportunities to promote better democracy and better governance mm. abroad. Um, and it's very fascinating looking at it, you know, 15 years ago, and then comparing it with today when America itself is demonstrating that, um, you know, it, it too can fall victim to this kind of populist rise. Hmm. It's interesting because um, the, I found that this book had a really, really strong diagnosis of the problem, of what's going on. And it, within two different ways, he, ta- he talks a lot about this illiberal democracy, which is a hard thing to understand because it's, it's not possible yet to determine if democracy as we know it, where people are empowered, is possible without some kind of liberal aspect. In other words, if Viktor Orban, who calls himself an illiberal Democrat, Mm -hmm. he calls Hungary now an illiberal democracy or a hierarchical democracy is the term that he's starting to use. I mean, what we're seeing in Hungary happen is authoritarianism. We're seeing the rise right now of a dictatorship because he is uh, reducing the rights of individuals because he is eliminating or at least subverting institutions all over the country. So can democracy even exist without some liberal aspect? So in other words, is illiberal democracy an oxymoron? But the other thing that Munch talks about in the book is undemocratic liberalism. Mm-hmm. And he, and, and in, his, in his diagnosis, he's as, as really as verbose about that as he is about illiberal democracy. But of course, I think in his, in his summary about what to do about these things, he lets that slide a little bit, in my estimation. Hmm. But really what I'm trying to say is, is that he is tackling these twin problems, these twin issues with our system, is that we're actually becoming undemocratic with time. And, and I, I wouldn't say too liberal, but our institutions are becoming so strong that there's a huge gap between the governed 
and the governing. Mm-hmm. And not just between, say, an MP and his constituents, but also, say, between in the European Union. You have this incredibly powerful organization of the European Union, the super state. But the countries that are within it really have no right to, to question the laws that come down from the European Union unless they do what Britain is doing, which is to leave and causing enormous problems. Right. And so what do we in that situation do? Well, it's obvious that there is a gap. And people feel like they're not actually being consulted. They're not in charge. They're not in living in a democracy. It's not, it doesn't feel democratic. Uh, another example of this, which I think is a really pithy one, is the central bank. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the decision over interest rates is a very undemocratic decision for good reason. Because if we allow the leader of a country to, to decide on interest rates, well, they're clearly going to decide on an interest rate for short-term benefit and long-term harm. And it happened way too many times until it was clear that we needed an institution that was insulated from democratic control. I think most people would agree with that, but there's probably many who wouldn't and say, no, everything should be open to democracy. Nothing should be uncontestable in the democratic domain. And it's not like interest rates are uncontestable. It's just, eh, they're removed. They're insulated from that. Right. And that's what uh, Munch is calling undemocratic liberalism. So what do you, do you see that as as much of a threat to our our our, um, our affairs, or do you see populism as a, as a, as I think Monk is as Monk does as a much bigger problem? I'm I, like I would be inclined to agree with with Monk's assessment, largely because you know, and he does have this dialogue about you know rights without democracy versus mm-hmm. democracy without rights, mm-hmm. and. I found it very interesting to see how he looked at it and how he really broke it apart. And I mean, his his initial sort of point is to look at our liberal democracy and break it apart and say, you know, these are actually two separate things that, that work together. Um, but what I find interesting is that while there is a lot of evidence and a lot of um, sentiment to suggest that, you know, uh, a, a liberalism without a democratic structure behind it, where, you know, it's governance by the experts or, or the supposed experts mm-hmm. um, that are calling the shots, um, where, while that might be, uh, that might pose its own kind of threats, the the real issue is that, or at least I think the bigger threat, is that people start to feel left out in, of that. And so they start looking for, um, while it's certainly a, issue that you have a kind of liberalism that is, uh, you know, experts calling the shots and running the show. Like a technocracy. Like a technocracy. At the same time, I think the larger threat is that people start to feel left out of the governance structure. And so they start looking for outsiders and fringe personalities who can then, you know, who profess to speak for them, who will then get in there and actually don't know how the system works. So there is this sort of like divorcing of, of, um, uh, what is ostensibly a balance or, or attempting to, to create a democratic balance. Um, you do have tech, you know, democracies and liberal democracies with technocratic tendencies, but at the same time, you can't just let everybody overrun, uh, overrun the situation or overrun, um, the, the system with this, these ideas of, you know, it's, there's simple solutions. Um, right, and this right. is something that Munch goes into in the in the book where he, he points out that a lot of the populists have a consistent message, which is that the situations um, the situations themselves just demand simple solutions, mm-hmm, simple mm-hmm. answers. And the truth is that political systems and dem- uh, democratic governance is kind of a complicated issue in many, many mm-hmm. respects. And so you have out, outliers and fringe figures coming in saying, oh, it's a simple fix, right? We've got too many immigrants, build a wall. Um, we've got right. bad deals, Im- you know, pull out of them. We don't even need to renegotiate them or get involved. And I think one thing that, uh, I think ultimately that's the larger threat because that's an actual threat to the operations of the system. And so you start seeing things that are closer to a democratic crisis um, start to emerge as a result. Well, yeah, I mean, there, I read a, an article in the LA Review of Books about this book, and it said something that, that I hadn't thought of before, which is that the terms that are used in this book, so illiberal democracy, uh, democracy without rights, rights without democracy, can actually um, obscure what's really going on um, and, and take us away from the real definitions or the real language that we should be using by using what you just said, simple terminology, because of course, Munk isn't writing for academics. He's writing for a wider audience. And what the, what this uh, review said, which was interesting was that 
if you're going to call it undemocratic liberalism, you're missing the point Mm -hmm. that really what it is is a technocratic oligarchy. Now, I I know we're getting into semantics here, (laughs) talking about these huge words, but really what they're saying is, is that this is not, a, it's it's not just undemocratic. It's rule by the few, not on behalf of the many, but to increase the power and the rights of the few, mm-hmm. right? At the expense of the power and the rights of the many, even if they provide the illusion that we're all equal. Um, systematically, it may be not true at all. Um, as we've seen in, in discriminatory societies since day one, when, when the few rule, they're going to enrich and enhance their own power. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's happened time and time again. And so what you're seeing is is maybe just the continuation of this cycle where the people feel like they're they're aggrieved and they're not part of democracy, they're not part of things, and so they want to have someone, an outsider, come in and shake things up and take control. And it's an attractive story. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the, the plot of a film Absolutely. that we would all cheer for and feel all good about when the outsider comes in and restores what's good. But then we never ask what happens the next day when they are when they're actually in power. That's right. And all too often, I mean, everybody likes a good underdog story, right? Right. But at the same time, uh, history tells us that you bring that underdog in. And in fact, there's an interesting uh, story that Munk illustrated with um, Park gyun Hai in South Korea, right? right? Bring in the reformer, bring in the outsider, and suddenly they fall victim to exactly what, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they railed against. Um, Now, of course, who's to say that they were really all that noble to begin with, right? Mm-hmm. The the idea with a lot of these populist narratives and a lot of populist n- messages is that someone comes in and they say, I'm going to shake things up, I'm going to change things. And ultimately, that was never really their intention. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you look at Donald Trump in the United States, and I mean, it, it it's actually hard to figure out exactly what his intention is from day to day. But, um, you know, if you look at some of the, the stories that are going on in Washington circles, there are indications that, you know, his, his hotel businesses have seen unprecedented growth. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, and he has not fully uh, disclosed just how much or if at all he's removed himself from the Trump organization mm-hmm. operations. Mm-hmm. So this is, it's an, it's an ongoing fi- thing. I would say an ongoing feature of, of populism and the, and the result of populist governance. Mm-hmm. I think even if you have a true hero, achieve power. It would, I mean, this is the classic thing, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, Uh right? Um, If you have a true hero, whatever that is, whatever that might mean or look like, achieve power, it's inevitable that they're going to be imperfect. And it's inevitable that they're going to have to make decisions that are less good for some and more good for others. Uh I know that's a, that's a terrible Neanderthal way of putting it, but really we're talking about the, um, that what power does and the aspect of power and how power is never fully, truly democratic. And maybe this is the admission of liberal democracy. And I think Munch says it early on in the book. He says that, um, you know, that the deal that liberal democracy made, if you're going to look at it from as a, as a pessimist, mm-hmm. is that we're going to give you the illusion that you're running things, but you're actually going to let us run things. And so long as you don't question it, we're going to give you prosperity and peace. And this is the question that Munk raises in the book, but a lot of other scholars have raised as well, right. which is, is, that, is the crisis of liberal democracy not so much about the idea of it, is the crisis actually about the decline of prosperity or the decline of an assured future, right? right. So um, I think uh, Munk says it in some way uh, as, you know, so long as liberal democracy fattened people's pocketbooks and promised a better tomorrow for them and their children and their grandchildren, well, then why wouldn't we believe in it? Right. Um, but as soon as the future is at stake and, and, and actually at risk and it looks like my kids are going to be worse off than me, well, I might want something different. And what's the big deal about liberal democracy anyways? And I think you're seeing this right now in China. There's an article that came out, to I think it was recently, might have been today, where they follow someone, a 36-year-old woman in China, under the new digital dictatorship, the, the social credit system. Hmm. Right. Where you are ranked and scored and on camera every second of every day. Right. And what you put in your trolley when you're in the supermarket is itemized and recorded on camera. And if you put diapers in your trolley, you're going to get points. But if you put alcohol in your trolley, you're going to get docked points. And it's actually recorded in real time. You're compared with other people. This is not only being developed in China, it is being implemented in China. And it's horrifying. Absolutely. But (laughs) but she thinks that it's good. This person that, that this article is following, she thinks, no, this isn't actually so bad because they promised me prosperity. And so far, they're delivering. 
We've seen the greatest migration in history happen as the Chinese people have moved from the countryside into the, into the cities. Mm -hmm. And they have moved from essentially poverty into the middle class. Now, as long as that continues to happen, it's hard for Chinese people to say, I'm not so into this communist thing. And the deal that the Chinese government has with its people, the unspoken social contract is, we're going to provide for you prosperity and you're not going to be involved in the running of it. Right. We're, right. You're not going to have democracy, but you will have prosperity. You're not going to have rights, but you will have bread on your table. And you're, in fact, you're going to have more bread on your table tomorrow and even more the day after that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that... And, and this is hotly debated, I think, in the political science community. Do you think that it's accurate to say that the real underlying force at play is not just the, doubt, not just the, the increase of inequality, but the, even the, the, the question of whether or not we're going to be pro more prosperous tomorrow than we were yesterday? I think it's a number of factors, but I think that, that looking at this one in particular is uh, quite important. I think it's something that we've all too often straight away from. In fact, going back very briefly to the book, um, Munch talks about how, uh, you know, income inequality is on the rise in Western democratic countries. Mm -hmm. And this idea that there's something of a, of a trade-off, as in you go along with these things so long as you're prosperous, uh, I, I think that there's an interesting argument there that deserves a lot of merit. Because, and he, he even goes into some of the facts here, you know, 60 years ago, uh, nine out of 10 Americans were able to come out of school, I mean, maybe go to school in the first place, come out of school, get a job, get a car, and get a house. Today, fewer than one in two Americans are able to do that comfortably. Uh, you know, is it is it too much to suggest that maybe this level of uh, insecurity, economic insecurity, instability that we're seeing uh, amongst the general population is also tied to the rise of people saying, well, you know what, this system isn't working for me. Why don't I vote for someone who's going to blow it all up? Um, Donald Trump, during one of his campaign stops, made the point, you know, <laughs> he, he literally got up there and said, what do you have to lose for voting for me? You've yeah. already lost so much. What do you have to lose? And I remember he actually targeted that line. He said, Hispanics, African Americans, what have you got to lose? He right. actually targeted it at minorities who did not vote for him en masse. That's right. Um, in the, hope, in the hope that they would, essentially saying, look, the system is screwing you over anyways. Mm -hmm. And it's an attractive, appealing argument at any time. But I think especially at a time when we're seeing a struggling, I wouldn't say struggling. I mean, the economies of the Western world are growing. They're just not growing at the rate they used to be. And in comparison to China and India, they're falling behind. Right. And that's the interesting thing is that if you look at some of the facts, especially if you look at Canada right now, um, I mean, I work in politics every day. I see a lot of n rhetoric around, oh, you know, this isn't working and that's not working and the government hasn't done this, the government hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. If you look at the stats, I mean, we're actually on the on the upper end. Everything's growing at this point. Uh, things are actually doing pretty well. The challenge is that most people, I think, are attracted to the negative message. It's easy to say that things aren't working, therefore we have to fix it. It's mm -hmm. a more attractive narrative to start believing mm -hmm. in or thinking about. Uh, you know, nothing sticks like a bad news story as opposed to the good news stories. Um, and so I think that, you know, in, in looking at things, there there is a, um, if you look at the United States, I think there is a, a tendency to um, characterize the system and characterize the entire process as um, broken or falling apart when there's actually a lot of uh, room for growth and a lot of potential. In fact, one of the things that is most interesting about the rise of Donald Trump in this populist narrative is that it comes after eight years of fairly stable governance coming out of the scandal free, too. scandal free. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the 2008 recession was one of the uh, worst economic events in American history the country saw incredible growth and and uh and rebuilding as a result but the tendency to you know i mean at the same time I, it's not like it was entirely perfect because clearly this this message has nevertheless stuck that things are broken and require some kind of action right. um in ca in many cases the most drastic action right let's just throw somebody in there blow it all up and start again mm -hmm. um it's it's interesting to see how that narrative has actually really taken hold in the collective voting uh, base. I I com I'm completely sympathetic to the idea of narrative and story. And mm -hmm. I mean, one of the um, 
inciting factors in doing this podcast is the whole concept of story. What is story? What are the stories that we tell? What is the story of our world? And, and Yuval Noah Harari, I don't know if you've, you've heard of him, but he's re- yeah, currently reading Sapiens right now. Yeah, actually, and, so. the, and his other books too. And, and they're, they're, I think they're really terrific. And he talks about story as mm-hmm. a really important aspect of what it means to be human and how human beings process the world around them. Um, and, and so this idea, and, and he was asked, what is going on? What on earth is going on in our world? And he said, the story is broken. Doesn't mean that, like, as you said, the statistics might all be right. But the story that we're telling ourselves is broken, and therefore we are scrambling to come up with a new one. Is the new story undemocratic liberalism? Is the new story um, illiberal democracy? Is it just authoritarianism? Is it, is it a digital dictatorship, as they're starting to implement in China? But I do want to play devil's advocate, because there's one point that's inescapable, that, that even if you're right, that all the numbers look good and everything looks like it's growing and we're doing all right in Canada and people are doing better and better, Maybe so, but it's undeniable that they're doing better and better less and less equally Uh and that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting getting poorer at a quicker and quicker rate and that that force is not only undeniable, but could it it eventually tear our society apart. In Canada, in the United States, this is growing around the Western world. Doesn't that frustrate the facts that you bring up about how we're doing better and better. Well, it certainly does. And I mean, it's, it's difficult to speak from, um, from that perspective of, of, you know, looking at things in terms of a, a general, um, a generally optimistic, uh, situation Mm -hmm. without recognizing that that's not the case for absolutely everybody. Um, in fact, uh, going back very briefly to, you know, uh, Fareed Zakaria's work a couple of years ago, he had an article on how, um, despite everyone's fears of terrorism and uh, international conflict, we're currently going through one of the most peaceful processes right. of the last 500 years. And I think that's great if you look at it from, a, from an objective scientific perspective, but it certainly doesn't feel like it day to day when you turn on the news and you see that you know this conflict has happened or this explosion has happened in a cafe in Istanbul or wherever. Right. And, and that actually relates to one other point that I wanted to bring up, which is social media and yep. the complete sea change in communications. And, and uh, uh, Munch brings this up as a, as a major factor for why we're seeing what we're seeing. The rise of many-to-many communications, right? So we had, as human beings, we have one-to-one communications, but with the invention of the printing press and then, of course, with mass media, we had one-to-many, and the many became millions and then billions. But now we have many-to-many, where billions are communicating with billions. And it's uh, complicated the communications picture of our planet, and it's complicated our species in ways that we can't understand nor anticipate. But what what is he getting at? What is he trying to say about what social media is doing um, and, and how does it factor into both the rise of populism but also perhaps the rise of undemocratic liberalism? Well, his basic point is that now that we, you know, it used to be the case that um, all of our communication was filtered. There was, uh, you know, even the beginning, I, I believe, you know, he has an interesting anecdote where he goes and looks at the invention of the printing press and how we look back on it with, you know, sort of a, a kind of reverence. And we, we think that, you know, this is what enabled communication and enabled the spread of ideas. And it has, but at the same time, it also meant that people were, you know, printing things that got them in serious trouble with the authorities of the day. It right. meant, you know, execution. It meant all these problems. So there's yeah. a, a bad side to it as well. Um, he's suggesting that with social media, we're seeing something fairly similar. The filters, those barriers that have, that have allowed for... Um, a, a kind of control of the message have now been opened up and everybody can have, you know, they can say whatever they want. They can tweet, retweet, share, send anything they want, any kind of opinion they, they might have. And, um, and what's this, what this is doing is it's enabling greater conversation, but it's also not necessarily enabling a positive conversation. Mm-hmm. And he, he actually has some interesting, um, anecdotes in there uh, of how, um, when social media really rose to prominence at the end of the, in the mid to end of the 2000s, lots of political scientists and democratic theorists were looking at it with kind of rose colored glasses. Like this is going to open things up uh, for, for, you know, new frontiers for democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, Looking at the, uh, the efforts of the green revolution in Iran in 2011. I remember, you know, writing a paper where I was a little bit, 
uh, hesitant to suddenly say that this is, you know, going to be this wonderful thing. And sure enough, I mean, that, that revolution, despite all the attention foisted on it by social media, it, it didn't really result in these major sweeping changes, pro-democratic changes that everyone wanted to see. Um, Munch is sort of getting at this idea that not only, not only is social media not the great savior for liberal democracy, now that we've opened up all these ideas and they're being shared on a constant basis, uh, it's actually eroding liberal democracy. You're seeing a plethora of viewpoints that are brought to this this uh, this you know new communication technology. I'd imagine that someone listening to this might might suggest in hearing that that okay, so liberal democracy is being undermined and destroyed by social media, but are we not creating just a new kind of democracy? You know, maybe illiberal democracy uh-huh. was impossible before, say, 2009, right? right. But Bef- before the Arab Spring in 2011, before today, illiberal democracy was impossible. But maybe now we're living in a world where a different kind of democracy, a many-to-many social media democracy is possible, the antithesis to the digital dictatorship in China. Maybe this is actually possible. And I, I, I have no evidence for this. I haven't thought about it before. But perhaps what someone, you know, a, sort of a, um, a technophile in San Francisco, a Silicon Valley booster might say is that we're creating a new world. Uh-huh. You don't understand it yet. We don't understand it yet. But the, the value of the individual will be maintained and your rights will be assured and you will be more prosperous than ever before. It's just going to feel a little bit different. <laughs> and the institutions are going to go by the wayside. And this is a, a seismic revolutionary change. Do you think that that's possible or am I just am I just uh paraphrasing what I don't understand? <laughs> no, I think I think someone out there if I I can easily foresee someone listening to this and thinking, "Hey, well, oh, this is just the the next stage. This means that everything's going to be open and this means that, you know, I mean, people look at social media as a form of enhancing the participation that people have in democracy, right? right? I think one thing that Munch looks at, and, and this is something that, you know, uh, it's maybe not concerted, but this this is something that I took away from the book, is that he I think even he might look at this and think that um, there's no guarantee that that's necessarily going to be the case. I think you can look at social media as disrupting traditional conventions of liberal democracy and then making it more participatory. But at the same time, that comes with its own cost in a way, right? right? Suddenly we're seeing all of these old ideas that we thought we'd um, beaten back, rushing back to the forefront Mm -hmm. and people saying, well, hey, maybe we should have, um, you know, an America first. Maybe we should have something that's much more nationalistic. Maybe we shouldn't have open borders. Well, there's a lot of people out there. I remember having a conversation with a good friend of mine seven years ago in London, uh, and we were talking about the rights of the individual, the protection, the John Stuart Mill idea mm. that of the, the tyranny of the majority and therefore the, the need to protect the rights of the individual and the minority. Because you can't have 60% of the population vote and decide to enslave the other 40%. Mm-hmm. You just can't do that. You, and therefore you cannot also have 99% of the people vote to have 1% enslaved or put to death or whatever. It's just, that's not what we do. Right. However, it's not necessarily not democracy. Athenian democracy was far from liberal democracy. It Absolutely. Was a, it was an aristocratic form of democracy. And so um, you're, I think you're right. I think there are costs to these things, and we need to be careful. We need to ask ourselves what we value. But the preeminent point of Munch's book is that there are different values, and those values are contradictory. That yes. The value of democracy and liberalism have gone, gone together quite well for a while, but now the contradictions and the cracks are showing. Um, I just want to read a quote on this social media vein. From the book, he says, To previous generations, it might have seemed natural that the people would rule through parliamentary institutions and elect their representatives by going to a polling station. But to a generation raised on the digital, plebiscitary, and immediate voting of Twitter and Facebook, of Big Brother and American Idol, these institutions have come to seem strangely cumbersome. And, mm. what, I, and what I also thought in reading that was, not only do they seem cumbersome, but they they seem almost more blatantly undemocratic. Yeah, yeah. Right? That the institutions of the Supreme Court in the face of American Idol seems even more undemocratic than it was before. Yeah, it doesn't just seem arcane. It seems almost obsolete. Right. Right? Like, right. if, you know, most people who are growing up in, uh, you know, in today's educational 
system. You know, you see kids who are growing up all the time, you know, with, with access to social media, the idea of an instant vote, an instant comment, an instant projection Mm -hmm. of their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So why is it, you know, I mean, you can, you could certainly envision people wondering why is it we have to, you know, go through the formal process? Why, why does there have to be a court system with so many levels of review or a representative that I elect right. and that they make decisions on my behalf. Why don't I just have a say in all those decisions? Exactly. Exactly. So what's the, what's the argument against that? Is it just too complicated? Like, I mean, there, I, and I think it is a fair one to say, look, the decisions that elected MPs or senators or congressmen or whatever have to make are just far too complicated to allow 35 or 350 million people to have a say in. They're too nuanced, and, and most people don't care. Most people haven't read the briefing book and can't make an informed decision. Right. Um, but it's easy also to say, well, you got to give them a chance, maybe. you got to give, give them a chance to be truly democratic. I don't know. Like, what do you think is, is being said here in this book? I mean, if someone is coming at this and they're thinking that, like, you know, yeah, in, in my... In my world where I can have things come to me instantly, you know, why do I have to trust in my representative, right? Or, and I think partially there is, there is a conversation that can be had about the kind of role that, that um, social media plays in a liberal democracy and in an existing democratic system. And I think one of the things that Monk, sorry, I think one of the things that Monk is getting at is that sentiment might be out there but it's not necessarily good for the operation of the democratic system. Okay. Um, whereas there might be a sentiment that you can have direct input and a direct say. And of course, in a democratic system, we want people to have a direct say. We want people to have direct inputs into how government is run. Well, that might be the case. At the same time, if you completely turn it over to everybody, then you you might not... I mean you're you're going to end up with one of two things either nothing is being done because there's too many voices or two things are being done but to those to the population's detriment right that's one of the overarching mm-hmm. arguments he's making about populism um far better to have that existing filter but also augment it with mm. social media um one of the things that you see in just about every political system, and especially with Canadian politics, and and you've seen this as well as I, is using social media to make your representative more relatable. So people are able to engage directly with their member of parliament, with their municipal councillor on a direct one-to-one level. Um, Certainly, you know, there, there might be the sentiment that it's not the same as them having a voice, but then at the same time, by having a representative who's able to take their concerns and voice them in a parliamentary or right. or in municipal city setting, um, you know, social media can be an, inv- an invaluable tool for making that representation more relevant. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a question here that is at play that it, I'm just gonna ju- I'm just gonna go for it. I'm gonna be uncouth <laughs> and just ask it: Are people incapable of governing themselves? <laughs> and, I, and you don't have I, no. I, the the interesting thing about that is that's a question that I think I think political theorists have wrestled with for hundreds of years, and I think we're still wrestling with it. Yeah. I think I think that the the consequences of governing themselves are at play all around us, and the com- and the consequences of not governing yourself mm-hmm. are also at play, and that we're seeing the the problems, the negatives, and the positives of both sides. Yep. Um, as we become more educated, as we have access to tools that can translate, and this is the way that Munch puts it, to translate the popular will into public policy. How does that happen? Right now it happens through engagement and elections and the sitting of MPs or Congress people in a room making decisions and concentrating power in the form of, say, a prime minister or a president. These are the ways that popular will is reflected in decision making. Uh-huh. But there are other institutions that frustrate that popular will, knowing that it might run roughshod over individual rights, but it also might run roughshod over, say, elite interests, Right. say, capitalism. Capitalism is entrenched in our system and is protected by the institutions that we're talking about. There's no way that the central bank, the Bank of Canada or the the Federal Reserve in the United States or any other central bank is just going to say, well, the people want uh, to scrap all of this, so we're just going to do that. They're going to resist that until they're no longer there. Uh And so there is a defense of elite interests. And, but, but I do have to, 
I'm asking this question not necessarily even to get an answer, but just to expose the idea that a lot of people are asking, is this even possible? Is democracy only ever possible as a partial democracy? Because if people aren't capable of doing this, then the outcome of letting them do it is disaster. And he says that the the traditions of democracy, quote unquote, in British and American thought, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, are anti-democratic. The fear of mob rule was one of the great motivators of the writing of the U.S. Constitution. Absolutely. And that modern British democracy is very much geared against the rule of the masses coming into power. There are many checks against that. And we have seen prosperity delivered as a result of a lot of these checks. But the the incumbent question in all of that, or the incumbent answer to the question is, no, the people are not capable of ruling themselves. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's, it's a tough one. And I recognize we're <laughs> sitting right now in the Parliament of Canada asking the question if people can rule themselves. And the implicit story is, is that yes, they can and yes, they do. But you look a little deeper and nah, not everything. And certainly not through other, anything other than an election every few years. Uh-huh. And, it's, and I don't know the answer to this question, and I certainly don't know um, even how to ask it in a better way. Yeah. But I think it is undeniably a part of this conversation. And I don't think I have a, a clear answer for it either, but I will say, you know, in looking at a history of democracy, even the most optimistic um, concepts of a liberal democratic system have some kind of imposition of a check and balance against mob rule, mm-hmm. against a wayward population that is just, you know, running roughshod all over the very idea of governing, you know, right. oneself. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as freedom, that having these conditions is implies a lack of freedom. Um, it certainly implies some restraint and constraint. But this is something that um, I think a lot of people have you know, over time, uh, taken to understood that we need in order to have a functional governing society. Um, you know, if you look at some of the more negative views of why we come together to govern ourselves, right? If you go back to Thomas Hobbes, it's entirely because our base nature is to tear each other apart. And so we start making concessions to, Mm -hmm. to come together, form a society and under, and, uh, and increase our chances of survival. Um, if you look at John Locke, it's a little more optimistic um, that we do have these rights and we don't, uh, we, we have no right to, to deprive each other of these inalienable rights. Mm-hmm. Um, but therefore, you know, we have to put certain constraints on ourselves in order to exercise those rights. Well, here's another question. We talk about rights, which are critical to mm-hmm. the understanding of liberal democracy. Rights are at the center of what liberal democracy is. You have rights, I have rights. They're enumerated in the U.S. Constitution or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or they're in the unwritten Constitution of Great Britain, but they exist, um, and and they are very much a part of how we govern ourselves and how we follow the rule of law. But they are also they're, they're things that we made up. They weren't they weren't written on tablets that were discovered and handed down to us millenn- millennia ago. Mm-hmm. They were things that we developed over time. To what extent are these rights um, utilitarian? And to what extent are they, um, are they about the value in themselves, right? So in other words, are, are rights a good thing because they lead to better outcomes? Or are they a good thing because they're just good? Right. I, I mean, I think if you look at it from an outcome-based perspective, um, there's certainly a key argument. And I would make that argument that by having these rights, we increase the, the possibility of our survival. Uh, you know, we set conditions for working together, for operating amongst each other, and we we create um, uh, the proper situation where, as a, a species, not to get you know necessarily biological into it, but mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. as a species, we're able to continue and we're able to continue evolving. Um, maybe there's an argument to be made that the creation or identification of rights is part of the evolutionary step of the human race. Like, we're so then that might mean that something might supersede them. That is a possibility. I, I don't think that it's necessarily going to be, you know, triggered by social media. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's certainly something to consider. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of the conversations right now around AI, artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. and the general AI or artificial general intelligence is that you're going to, we might create an entity that is so far superior to us intellectually that it will say rights 
what are what are these things you're hanging on to? Mm-hmm. I am far far past that. It's time for you to get over yourselves, right? Um, and that we will de- have to deal with an intelligence that doesn't respect where we are in our story and has a completely different story a thousand pages ahead. And whether it tries to impose that upon us, if it's a dominant AI or whatever, or whether we just have to reckon with the idea that maybe we're actually, we're just living in our time. And there's actually a really interesting word that Monk uses in the book. Uh, he calls it chronocentrism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the often errant belief that one's own moment in time is somehow central to history. Right. And I think that both in this book and in this conversation, we may be practicing a bit of chronocentrism, thinking that this is all so important right now. But I, I do think that there is a confluence of forces that Munch identifies that are unprecedented in our history. Mm-hmm. Social media, growing inequality, uh, and the technology that goes with social media, growing inequality. And he also talks about how monoethnic nations are becoming multi-ethnic and yep. multicultural nations, which is a major shift, whether we like it or not. These are changes that, that are, are to societies that didn't look like this at all 70 years ago. Right. Um, and these are things that we have to grapple with. And so well, while I may be chronocentric in saying so and privileging my own time over others, there's no doubt that we're living in, in, <laughs> in an unprecedented and tipping point moment. Well, and it's the sort of... Uh, moment where things are happening at a faster and faster pace. Right. Um, and I think while I, I found that that portion of the book very interesting to look at things, you know, chronocentrically, and he, he seems to ascribe it mostly to the technological moment, right? To look at all of our advancements in technology, social media being one of them, you know, globalization, uh, globalization being a, a product of increased telecommunication and all these things. I think it is interesting to, to look at that and just say, well, maybe we're Maybe we're focusing too much on things, you know, maybe this moment in time isn't all that important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you look at some of these advancements, particularly with how they relate to the evolution of political governance, um, you do see a lot of really rampant uh, rapid change happening very, very quickly and having very real uh, implications, um, especially global implication. Um, So I think I think that. uh, Whereas there might be a tendency to write it off, uh, to, to write certain analyses off as chronocentric, the frequency and intensity with which things are happening does indicate that we are living through a very key critical moment in our time. And I wonder if a, a future AI dominant superior intelligence would say, well, you thought so, but it got mm-hmm. a lot faster, a lot quicker, and it's still getting faster today, or eh, it was just a blip on the screen. That's right. Right. Or yeah. are we really living in a tipping point? It's hard to not see it that way, but also, I mean, this is one little moment yeah. in our species 200,000 year history. Um, Alex, we're at the end of our time. So I got one last question for you, sure. which is um, what have we, um, what have we missed in the book that you really wanted to, to tackle and talk about? Like what have we talked about a lot? We've, we've talked about the, the, contradiction between democracy and liberalism and how they went together for a long time and now are seeming to be torn apart with their inherent contradictions, the rise of social media and the effects that have had on our, on our world and on this contradiction. We talked about authoritarian populism, illiberal democracy. What have, we, what have we not talked about that you wish we had? I think the one thing that I'd really like to talk about that we haven't really covered yet, and Munch does go into it, is what to do about it all. In the present moment so he has a couple of suggestions and he has some ideas they're not i wouldn't say they're they're completely you know they're not they're not automatic automatic uh, prescriptions they're not instant solutions um but he does have some interesting ideas for how we can start to navigate and maybe things maybe bring things back on track so when it comes to social media he suggests that what we need to do um you know we're talking about how social media can have people more involved in the democratic process. Mm -hmm. Uh, He suggests renewing civic faith and having this idea of, you know, educating people more with with respect to their role in the political system, um, ensuring that every citizen is a good, politically active, politically engaged citizen who has some understanding. When it comes to income inequality and that being a driving force of, of, um, you know, leading people to feel that the system has failed them and so they're looking towards populism as a as an answer um he suggests uh implementing some bold agendas to start getting income inequality back on track start closing that gap 
Um, and in fact, I, one of the things that I really appreciated with respect to his suggestions was, you know, he looks he looks very briefly at the 2016 election and what the Clinton campaign was saying and doing, and he holds it up as a model of someone who was, in his in his view, amplifying a status quo. Granted, a, a very liberally democratic status quo, but a status quo nonetheless. And his prescription for future political campaigns and future politicians is to think of bold solutions and present them as an antidote to the populist narrative. I found that a very interesting uh, argument, and I found that to be something that going forward, as we look at uh, the the deconsolidation of liberal democracy, um, something to, to really bear in mind, because if we're going to continue, if we truly do want to practice liberal democracy, and I'm someone who I would consider a pretty, you know, ardent advocate of a liberal democratic system, then he suggests that we need to get passionate about it, and we need to start fighting back and pushing against mm. those uh, those factors that are starting to chip away at and it. And I think also not just fighting for the status quo. Exactly. But fighting for a renewal, yes. something, yeah. something different, maybe that there's change in that, that you can preserve the good things about it, but also do away with some of the bad, whether that's the oligarchy or the technocracy, or just, the, the, the again, that gap between the governed and the governing. Yeah, exactly. I think his, what's interesting is that his argument is basically to say that, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a Democrat or if you're a liberal here in Canada, um, it's not enough to, you know, if someone is saying the system's broken, it's not enough to say, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. You have to say, okay, we have to fix it, mm -hmm. but not in this guy's way or not in that person's way. We, we can fix it this way so that everyone benefits. We can fix it in this way so that we're moving forward and we're opening things up to progress. Fix it in line with our values. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to read a quote, which I guess is probably going to be the quote of the week. I've never done this before, putting, putting the quote of the week in the actual conversation, oh, but I'm exciting. just going to say screw it and do it. Um, so this is from James Madison, one of the founding fathers of the United States, one of the architects of the U.S. Constitution, um, someone who thought long and hard about rights and and the foundation of a democracy and what it should look like and how a republic would be able to function and stand up against the monarchy that it used to be. Um, and he writes, and this is from the book, so Munch is quoting James Madison, and now I'm giving you that quote. And it's an answer to the question, are people capable of governing themselves? And he says, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. And I think I'm just taking that to say that if it's possible, the only way it's possible is with knowledge and information. Um, yeah. To totally agreed. I mean, that's that's a pretty poignant quote. I like that. Yeah. Um, Alex, this has been terrific. A great conversation as always. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. That's the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember that in addition to getting this podcast on any app of your choice, you can also stream it live anytime and get further information at the website, www.wogopodcast.com. That's W-O-E-G-O podcast.com. Now your quote of the week is from James Madison, as promised, and it goes like this. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. Thanks again.